Okay, welcome everybody. Our uh, next session of discussing the Grossberg book. Today we'll dive into adaptive resonance theory. Um, it's a real claim to fame of Steve uh, and kind of alongside his, his work on vision, uh, the, like which I think these are the two big pillars, his way of thinking about vision and adaptive resonance theory, which as we'll see have kind of cross-pollinated each other a little bit. So I'm just gonna extract some ideas from this chapter, chapter five, because there's so much in there. Um, a lot of which is to convince people that it's neurally plausible. And sometimes the opposite kind of happens. It's like the more of the evidence you kind of pile on, the more you're like, you know, me thinks the lady protested too much. Um, so, but I, I like just the key, the idea uh, of, of how the theory works. And then if you are, if you find it interesting, you can, you know, hunt for the neural evidence uh, in all these books and papers that have been coming out. So, my plan is well, talking about learning. And this is the exact sort of heart of the, the singularity of where everything comes together, this topic, where artificial intelligence, machine learning, cognitive science, neuroscience, philosophy of mind, everything kind of clusters um, around this um, set of issues that, that crop up here. Um, and uh, produce all kinds of irritation and disagreement and all, all of that. So this is right where it is. <laughs> um, so we'll talk about out of all the different types of learning that are in, in under that first heading, unsupervised learning, because that's that's what art is basically. Um, we'll talk about the in-star, out-star learning rules uh, that Steve has been, has basically developed them in the 60s, uh, as it was in that, um, that 1964 uh, document. Um, so adaptive resonance theory is what we're going to talk about and how it uses template guided learning. Uh, and we'll talk about vigilance. I keep talking about how cool this idea is. Um, and uh, a, a little bit about disorders from the perspective of art, if we, if we have time for that. Um, so just to frame this, uh, part of the kind of learning that overlaps with tech and neuroscience, cognitive science and philosophy involves what Margaret Borden uh, refers to as universals. Although nowadays very few people would call it that for, and I think for good reason. But so here you have to kind of give credit well to the, to, to the philosophers for first sort of initiating this sort of topic and, and kind of uh, slowly dragging it away from the domain of, of um, spirits and sort of dualism. So, so even uh, at the time of John Locke, uh, a lot of things that the mind was up to were attributed to the soul. So there was this, you know, pneumatology studying the soul. And um, gradually over the course of that century, physiological ideas and the way Descartes framed things meant that you could start bringing things out of this uh, sort of supernatural realm and into the realm of, of, uh, of the physical. Uh, but versions of this sort of kind of uh, distinction between um, universals, what, what basically categories in one sense, and um, and particulars uh, has been have been has been kicking around, and you see, you know, Plato and Aristotle kind of have taking up two sides of that argument, and versions of this debate were present uh, between uh, Hindus and Buddhists of various sorts uh, in in the Middle Ages. So 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 Hume takes this idea um, of the idea of impressions. Um, so, you know, you kind of swung from one end to the other in the history of, of um, philosophy and early psychology from a kind of strong bias towards um, the soul doing all the difficult things, basically, to do with human cognition, and then swinging to, the, to, to this uh, extreme other position, which maybe very few people would have uh, had articulated before that, which is that everything just comes through the senses, and that um, thinking higher cognition is some sort of just combinatorics, just sort of putting things together from putting what you received from outside the world together. Um, and versions of, the, of this kind of keep, keep kicking around, like people who think, well, we just pick up information from the world. Um, so in this book, um, she talks, uh, this, is a, this is a, I mentioned before, but this is a, a really good book for the history. So uh, Warren McCulloch of McCulloch Pitt's Neuron Fame, that's him with, with Pitts on, on, the, on the right. Um, and uh, so he talked about <clears throat> this using the, the, the philosophical language. How do we know universals? 
How do we assign different and slightly differing things to classes? I don't think this is actually what the issue is, but we'll get to that. Um, and so what is a man made of fallible neurons that he may know no, uh, no, a number <laughs> infallibly? Uh, but I read these kind of grandiose statements from him. I'm reminded of Alan Turing, who apparently when he met him, he thought he was a charlatan. <laughs> um, but, uh, but he was an important charlatan in the, in the history of, of uh, computer science, AI, and neuroscience to some extent. And he was a neurologist, but his contribution to neuroscience is not a, very clear. Um, so, so, but he was involved in these crucial papers. How do we know universals? The paper with, Mac with Pitts. And um, he was also on what the frog's eye tells the frog's brain. And when we talked about vision, we kind of got a, a glimpse of the kind of research that came from that whole tradition. Um, and that's where you start to see these computer metaphors immediately start to show up in, in neuroscience that neurons or groups of neurons are coding um, for, for features. To this day, people have problems with the, the metaphor of code. Uh, and what does it mean really? What does it imply? Um, I think that the people who originally started using it were fairly superficial in, in their use of it for good reason. It's like when you don't know how something works, you have to use the metaphors that, that uh, are available. Um, and you'll see that Steve routinely uses the word code um, but not in a strong way. He's not saying that there's like coding is happening in the sense of writing computer code. Uh, far from it, actually. So, again, another grand phrase from from McCulloch is that that uh, these these steps are the first major steps in experimental epistemology. Quite a wild phrase, <laughs> but there's something to it. Um, but. But is this really an issue of, like, is the term universal really about epistemology or ontology? It's actually the latter, if you look at, like, the, the history of the term. Uh, because universals were defined as a class of mind-independent entities. Um, and so people were kind of debating whether they were real or not. Because nobody denied that, they, that people use uh, categories, um, concepts that, that were seemingly general in a way that we'll specify. Um, but people were like, well, do they, do, does the fact that I use a category mean the categories exist in, you know, an ontological sense? And there you have a, 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 a split which has shown up um, definitely all over Europe throughout its history and definitely in India also between realists and nominalists. nominalists. So most of the Buddhists, for instance, were, were nominalists and uh, some of the Hindus were realists about concepts, about higher order groupings of things. And uh, the, the nominalists and the conceptualists say, well, they're just sort of, they're only in the mind, they're just for convenience. And in the case of the Buddhists, they would say they are, you know, an inconvenience <laughs> ultimately uh, to, be, to be dismantled. Um, so, so yeah, conceptualists explain similarity among individuals by appealing to general concepts of, or ideas, things that exist only in mind. But obviously that epistemology versus ontology issue kind of collapses once you, are start, once you start talking about the mind, which is why McCulloch probably, and maybe others also were using this term in what was clearly an epistemological sense, not an ontological sense for now, or at least for that, for the period in which they were introducing it. But, you know, I'm not gonna really get into this, but how could something that exists only in the mind be useful in the first place? Um, and, uh, not necessarily a rhetorical question. There are, I'm sure lots and lots of long-winded answers to questions like this. Um, and so, like I said, analogous disputes, nominalist versus realist, exist within the brain and mind sciences outside of the ontological question. So, so for instance, all these critiques of representation and symbol um, are a version, a kind of manifestation of the same issue. Um, because a, a nominalist perspective on, on thing, internal structures in the brain is a little bit more like um, highly context dependent, bolted to what's real and what's particular, um, so the particular behaviors and particular contexts. So there's a sort of spectrum that you can see. So <laughs> what are these things? Categories, concepts, symbols, representations. Might as well get right into it. <laughs> uh, do you think they are all the same? Do they all share features? Would anybody like to say why one of more of them are the odd men out in this? 
list. I mean, they're not all exactly the same, but. <laughs> so, I mean, look, I, I mean, I would take the, the word coding as Steve uses it purely from Shannon, not from a philosophical concept, which is all of these things are versions of compression of information, lossy compression of information, as is the organization of the retina and the fact that we actively sample information and everything else. I mean, the, the brain is, is ultimately a very, very good lossy compression mechanism. Right, so, but he does want to talk about things like the symbol darning problem, which, uh, which we'll, we, you know, we'll talk about what he says later, but, but uh, so what are they? Okay, so here's a question. Uh, in the, let's, let's leave off symbols for now. Do animals have categorization? Probably, right? Do they have concepts? I mean, you can you can teach monkeys to do transitive inference. All right. Yeah. 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 So 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 that's a that's a good example of that's something that's more like a concept than just a bare, bare category. Uh, animals animals have concepts, but they don't have language, which is a powerful concept generator. So they only get the concepts that they're able to discover in the input data. Yeah. Yeah. And. Uh, I, you know, just having worked with monkeys for eight years, um, they understand a lot of what you're telling them. Interesting. And then I'm sure body language and things like that. Yeah. A big part of the tone of voice. Oh, no, they understand prosody to much better than most people do. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. So Steve does talk about symbols. So what is a symbol over and above a category? Somebody's going to say something. Surely. I would say symbols are more um, used. Categories are ways of thinking about something. It's not so active. Like a symbol just implies something is going to be used to, in place of something, to work with something. Whereas a category is, is how it fits in. I, I'm thinking about how they're used in common daily usage. A symbol is more often. Uh, a character or concept that is serves some purpose that you can manipulate with other symbols. Whereas a category is, this thing is like these other things. That's good, yeah, because the, 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 the combinatoric aspect of it, I think, is important. Jesse did that. I, I think symbols are just sort of the recruitment of a uh, temporal system, like a system sort of in the infrotemporal area that is sort of sees correlated behavior with concepts that are generated sort of for other reasons. I mean, I, I think it's- Specifically, it's, it's like more, some specific part of the temporal loop. I think symbols are, are sort of like a recruitment of the language system or the output system that just goes so along no, with- So it. no language, no symbols. But I, that's fair. I think a lot of people would, would be okay with that. I, I mean, sure. I would say a symbol is how you broadcast a category outside your mind. I agree. Um, but maybe there's more to it. It's also yeah. sometimes a way you broadcast it within your own mind. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Language is that definitely not like. necessary for a symbol. I mean, you could imagine playing chess. That's a very non-linguistic thing for a lot of people. And you have clear symbols for chess moves. Uh, you know, you can think of a knight as a symbol, the drawing of a knight, and then you could think of it on a piece of paper and how you move it. That's totally non-linguistic. But could you learn chess without knowing language? I'm going to say absolutely. No. I'm sure there's people who are aphasic who could learn it. That is a. I doubt it, but like I'm, I'd be happy to be proven wrong. Well, I haven't seen I that. I actually remember. Well. I remember Ev Fedorenko was telling us in one of our classes that people who uh, had some kind of aphasia where they lost their language actually could play chess. But they had language originally. Sorry? But they, they had language at some point in their lives. Yes. And it's not like several children learning, play, learning to play chess just directly, right? Yeah, that would be a more difficult experiment. Yeah. Well, look, you, you know, if, if Krishna... <laughs> it might not be ethical either. 
<laughs> if, if, Krish, if Krishna and Marge Livingstone can teach monkeys how to do symbolic addition, I think they could probably teach them how to play chess with enough uh, time. A heck of a lot of trials, okay. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe, yeah. I should look into that. Um, representation, I think this is boring. We've talked about it a lot. So symbolic, okay, what's a symbolic representation? People often use these two words together. So we've talked about topographic representations. I think there are less, they are less controversial because we call them maps. What's a symbolic representation? Okay, I have another explanation for simple symbols. So I'm in the kitchen, I was just cooking and I've noticed it's easier for me to think about cooking when I'm in the kitchen, when I'm in that environment. And I think perceptually people have an easier time maintaining visual categories when they're looking at the thing. Um, and so, I think in some sense, symbols are representations which are stable in the absence of uh, corresponding input. Ah, okay. I like that. Yeah, yeah. But how's that different than a representation? Degree of invariance is what I would say. Hmm. Um, so just to, to kind of throw, I love the etymology here because the word symbol comes from a Greek word which ultimately comes from throwing or casting together. So the bowl part is the same bowl of like parabola and hyperbole and things like that. And so uh, the, the two part nature of it is, off, uh, is something that we haven't actually mentioned all that much. And it gets forgotten the idea that a symbol stands for something else, that, that relationship, uh, which people find very difficult to um, elucidate. And that's kind of what the symbol grounding problem is, because you can start to think about symbols purely in terms of their visible manifest form, the dis discrete sharpness, and even the invariant properties when you're looking at, say, somebody else manipulating symbols. You might not know what, what um, the symbols mean, but you can say, oh, that, it looks like that person is manipulating symbols, just from the way that the symbols are um, seem, seem to be juxtaposed with each other, for instance. I, I haven't really thought about this much. Um, you know, I think all these things are, are definitely different, but it's they're very difficult to define. But I wonder if some of the, the, because symbols are kind of attached to language, that some of the concepts from language are relevant, like the, the idea of replacement. So like, um, I think that, that maybe that, that, is, that is a crucial thing. Like a symbol could be, in the same situation, could another symbol could be there, and that would mean something different. But there's sort of like a slot that's replaceable. Um, yeah, I think that uh, you know, getting toward the whole move and merge kind of you know Chomsky way of thinking is, is important, and that relates to the combinatoric thing, and to kind of fleshing out what people mean when they see symbol manipulation. They're sort of like algebraic manipulations, at least at, on the surface level. Uh, and later on, we might say that the surface level is not adequate. Um, and represent on the other hand, but it also has this tying together kind of component because there's two things. Yeah. There's something to be presented and then there's something that's doing the, the, the representing. The re part, some people think it means like present again. It's not what it means. <laughs> that's not where the re in represent comes from. It's, a, it's sort of an intensifier. Um, but uh, yeah, endless confusion comes from, uh, <laughs> from people getting hung up on these words. But I'm going to say that it's not actually that complicated for a scientist to start talking about. Uh, like the, the stuff about how it is subjectively and which parts are conscious and which not, maybe harder to talk about. But practically speaking, what we're talking about are types of invariants. Like, so we can, in general, articulate um, for the simple things like categories pretty easily what the uh, invariance is with respect to. So the, so the task is, is it's initially quite easy to say, oh, my face recognition system is invariant to various sorts of things. Um, and I can form categories. Those aren't yet symbols. But then once I have those categories, somebody can say, well, that person's name is so-and-so. So there's an integration between the ability to form categories and the ability to then produce or attach symbols to them. And those symbols, and that it has an, some additional invariance, meaning that you can completely take a symbol out of its context where you initially experienced it or something like that. And it can often sort of be used to kind of recreate aspects of its original context. So it's like a little key to unlock certain things. All right. But, but wouldn't, wouldn't other, kind of, other kinds of representation and in general, like 
signs also share that property in the sense that um, uh, you, so I'm thinking sort of in, in like Persian, uh, the, the Persian way to think about it. And if you see smoke in a different, in a completely different context, then that wouldn't refer to there being, let's say, a fire. Um, and it, it, it just seems that th there's other things besides symbols that have the exact property that you just sort of spelled out in terms of referring to something else outside of the original context that you saw it in. Right, which is why association start is like part, part of the way they are. Um, but you could you could say that because there's so many different types of smoke, that by the time you start to, to use smoke as a sign for something else, then that act is turning smoke into a symbol. Or, or if you want to be very, like, like, let's say that there's some group of people who hasn't actually named it yet, but they've decided or they've, they've formed all the associations for, oh, there's fire over there. Uh, it becomes easier to then label name that thing. Um, because you have the the category for it, because because the behaviors that that uh, you sort of associate with with that um, are kind of categorizing uh, are like a way of implicitly using uh, that particular stimulus as as a, as a symbol. So so I think one useful sort of framework to think about this in um, academically is from the idea of archaeology. Um, and, you know, I, I just have to be reading a history of the Vikings, um, which they, and they obviously start with very different priors um, in terms of how to think about the world and et cetera, et cetera, than we do. And there are things that are pretty unambiguous in archaeology. For example, we know what a boat is, um, but there are things that are very ambiguous in archaeology and have been continually revised as we get new information um, in terms of what they mean. So, you know, I think, I think at some level, one way to think about something that is a symbol or especially an invariant symbol is something that if an archaeologist uh, dug up, they would know what it is and be able to label it. And that would not change as further things were dug up. I like that example because it reminds me of the Indus Valley uh, civilization's symbol. And, and some people say it's a script. Uh, and and you know there's this, yeah, but but there's other people who looked at them and analyzed them and says that they, they're, they're too short to be a script of any sort. Maybe they are names or something else. But uh, but it's it's the fact that they seem to be used with, in this permutation way that gives you clues. Uh, so 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 and that's part of the the reason that you can start to talk about symbols even when you don't know what the representation is. So archaeology is really good. Uh, like I, like it's like this. If everybody has forgotten what the rules are to use an abacus. Is it still an abacus? Uh, but in some sense, the fact that it's constructed in a certain way kind of gives you clues that even if nobody remembers. It's like that, that game, one of those old games uh, that someone figured out the rules to it that from Babylon or something. What was the name? Irving oh, Finkel. Um, but you know, it's not like it magically became a, a symbolic uh, kind of rule set only at the moment that he discovered what the rules were. So there's a sense in which you, kind of inf you can infer uh, just from the parts of that are a symbol manipulation system other than the ref reference. Somehow internally you can start to learn things about it. The world but, game of her, by the way. Yes, that game, yes. Um, but for, for our purposes in, in, in adaptive resonance theory and for most of machine learning, um, the symbol that we're ta that talking about is just a category node. And what we mean by that is just a label or something that isn't even a label, it's something that potentially could be a label. So in all the, the deep deep nets, all these uh, artificial systems that have become super ubiquitous since uh, 2012 or so, the output layer is, so you have these layers that, uh, so you have a feature set that your, that your input, um, uh, feature space that your input lives in. And then what you want at the outside is some sort of categorization. Um, so that's supervised learning where you say, you know, is it this or that? It could be people's names. It could be something else like animals or types of something or the other. And this is from Wikipedia. This is just the standard like um, kind of way of trying to talk about both 
um, supervised and unsupervised together. So unsupervised learning is where you're kind of implicitly grouping the input without any labels that you've chosen beforehand. And that's you know very useful. Uh, not talked about as much in the machine learning world, but it's really, really important to be able to do that. And from the human sort of psychological perspective, it's clear that humans learn because they have teachers labeling things. But in order to label things, there's, there needs to be some kind of creation of invariance already on the part of, of the person listening to the labels. So otherwise it's hard to get started. Like, like if I point to something and there's no sort of prior hypo guess about what it is that I'm pointing to, how can a name actually land? So the thing to which a name gets attached um, actually has to have some structure that the, the person doing the naming has not actually provided. So these two things for any kind of sophisticated learner have to be closely linked. Um, some early versions of this architecture that we keep seeing nowadays were when uh, Oliver Selfridge's pandemonium where uh, he you know, personifies the little detectors. This is purely a conceptual model, but, but it was important in teaching and getting the connectionist thing kind of going. Um, so you have like a, an, a visual pattern that has, you know, looks like a letter A. But how does, what, where does the fact that it looks like a letter A actually show up? You might break up, like we, we talked about last time, break up some pattern into individual features. You kind of extract the invariance when you see multiple A's and say, okay, all of these things uh, are an A. So this can happen in this case, because there are labels that have, it has to be supervised. And then at the output, you have the, the final category label. Um, so if you think about it in terms of what's input, you have some sort of feature space. And um, when you have labels, you're slicing up the feature space. You're saying everything on uh, this zone is one thing and everyone in this other zone of feature space is something else. And there's various ways of doing this in machine learning, which are not concerned with you know, wh whether they're plausible as, as neural um, models. But, uh, but adaptive resonance theory kind of sits in the middle because it it's been pitched and ha it has been used for machine learning purposes, maybe not that as much as other methods, but it's also mainly presented as learning theory for how, how organisms, humans learn. So, um, supervised learning is very familiar because you have a label and then you say whatever it, whatever you do, make sure that when you see some this this thing, this exemplar at, attach this label. So that's like you know on the left, you you have data points that already have labels, red and green in this case. And what you end up learning through these super, supervised uh, methods is some kind of way of separating them, so that the next time you see something that doesn't have a label, uh, you can say ah this is red. And unsupervised learning does something else. You aren't given any um, labels, but it's just the raw date, the, the, the features, however you pre-process them, pre -process them the exemplars in feature space. And the typical way to think about it is clustering. You're, you're, you're seeing if there's some latent structure in the body of, of uh, experiences or exemplars if it's not uh, a, li you know, a living organism. And so, as I was saying, since these two things are linked, you could ask, for instance, in, a, in one of those classic examples of, of uh, classification, uh, such as like biological classification, which is it? Like, um, uh, and, 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 this, and what I was saying before is that if people op prior to the invention of the classification schemes weren't already kind of implicitly grouping things, it would be very difficult to attach names to groups. Um, so these two things are happening simultaneously. So even before anyone decides to attach labels to things, there are implicit groupings. Like farmers, for instance, might not have names for different um, subgroups of the animals that they breed, but they may be well aware that uh, this type I need to treat this way and this type I need to treat this way. So, they, so that's close to the implicit categories. So, so I think it's important at this moment to, you know, um, so I, I, I dropped Barbara Moore's um, really great paper about art as, you know, art compared to other clustering algorithms into the, into the chat at the beginning, um, since it's very, very clearly written. Um, and, you know, I think, I think so, so one thing that uh, when I try to communicate about Steve's ideas with other people uh, who are not familiar with them is that 
almost everybody defaults in their thinking to art is a reinforcement learning algorithm, which it very much is not. Yeah, that's weird. And, and you know, I think, but I think you, we need to contextualize this, which is that you have unsupervised learning, which art one is unsupervised learning. You have reinforcement learning, which is, you, I guess you could call semi-supervised learning in the sense that you are getting feedback, but the feedback is non-specific to a complicated environment. And so then we get credit assignment and all these other things that a lot of people are in this group are working on at some level. And then we get supervised learning, which is what we can do on Silicon, where we can actually give the algorithms a, a unambiguous label. And, you know, I think it's, I think it's very important when thinking about learning and when thinking about what we can get, get out of learning to, you know, clearly realize that it's not quite a continuum, but there is, there is a spectrum yeah. of, of different levels of supervision and what you get mathematically, depending on what aspects of feedback you have in the spectrum and what learning rules you come up with are, are very different. In fact, that reminds me, because just today I was looking at some of the old papers and he uses the word reinforce in, in, the, in these papers. And that might have, like, even just as something as simple as that might have caused some confusion um, because he means you reinforce in a kind of self-stabilizing way. We'll, we'll probably get to that. Um, so yeah, this is probably both. And so I actually already mentioned this, so, but it reminded me of this, this classic far side comic about names we give dogs versus the names they give themselves. Do they give names to themselves? Do, do, do whales, for instance, name things? I'm very curious to know if animals actually engage in assigning arbitrary labels to things. So, um, uh, and we, we've kind of implicitly been talking about this. What has been added to an implicit category when it is baptized with a name or gesture or something else? And, and I think we've covered like combinatoric possibilities. And in a sense, those combinatoric possibilities enable you to explore aspects of possibility space that are far removed from the actual. Like, like, uh, like when you just sort of talk in like half nonsense, like you can kind of give you ideas sometimes. Uh, so that's like, you know, the extreme version of just literally pulling symbols out of a hat and arranging them in sequences. And that can kind of stimulate some sort of thinking. Uh, and what functionality is missing from categories that is present in symbols or concepts. I think that what I just said kind of covers a lot of it, but any other suggestions? Like the concept is a much broader term. We didn't really talk about it much, but what do we want from concepts that isn't in what we've covered? Well, you know, I think Steve would just say that the, that you're, what you're doing is you're stacking arts. Right. Each time you stack an art, the input, you know, level is, when the input level is in a feature space or the input levels in a category space, you know, when you stack another art onto it, you get another generalization. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, um, during the CNS at 15 conference, um, I mean, I remember Steve commenting, and this was before you got to CNS, Johan. The year before, um, yeah. Uh, you know, he was, I mean, Steve said in response to one question, I think, and this is the only time I've ever heard him say that, that basically he thinks the difference between monkeys and people or monkeys have six arts and humans have seven. <laughs> well chosen number. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, and, and this also I've kind of anticipated with this idea that like with conditioning, or any, like there's all this internal kind of structure that is needed in, and which people like Skinner, who didn't want to talk about internal states, were implicitly discovering, which is the types of, of, of invariants that the animal has already constructed and to which they can associate um, uh, meaning in the, in, the, in the sense of rewards and punishments. But, so what did Grossberg say? Uh, all these terms are there, right? So the concept of a chair is more general than the particular size, sizes, shapes, and colors. We can hereby use language to represent abstract concepts. It doesn't actually get into much linguistic modeling at, at early, but, and there's, you know, it's hard. No, no one has a good language model. Um, so how does our mind transform the conti continuous perceptual patterns that we perceive into abstract 
cognitive symbols. I don't think continuity is important here so much as like constantly varying or varying in many, many ways. Um, how do we extract symbolic rules from the continuous ebb and flow of experience? And I like this phrase. Uh, how do we use symbols and rules to reorganize and interpret the world of continuous patterned sensory in, in information. And I, I like that re reorganized idea because um, it relates to the idea that once you have certain uh, categories, concepts, symbols, they, they go back out into the world and influence how you interact with it. Um, so this relates to what Nico brought up about the confusion regarding art is here, I'm not talking about the supervised versus unsupervised, but because there's both, there's a family of, of models Art itself is unsupervised, art map is supervised, and you can attach that to a reinforcement system. For instance, once you have a category or a set of categories, you can just sort of present that to a reinforcement learning system and it will collect the rewards and punishments. And you can, that can be relatively modular. You know? uh, although in, 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 in the real world, like the types of rewards you get might influence where and how you draw the boundaries between categories. And uh, sort of get into that at the end of this. But I just put some numbers on this just to, to compare because Steve sort of talks about the machine learning applications and, and but also he's mainly focused on it on being neuroscience. So I just gave ratings to all of this on a scale of one to a hundred. And um, obviously something like the Hodgkin Huxley model is so successful that it might as well be treated as synonymous with reality. No, it isn't. Um, but it's not actually modeling any sort of behavior. And, you know, good luck to you if you plan to model behavior with Hodgkin Huxley networks. <laughs> it's not, not very easy. And the types of things you can model are very limited, but just, in just because of the computational complexity. Interpretability is pretty high for, for those types of, uh, I mean, because like, in fact, uh, even the seemingly curve fitting related things that Hodgkin Huxley did turned out to be very good ways of modeling um, receptors. So that's great. So, the, so even the things that you weren't interpreting necessarily as physical structures became physical structures. Um, McCulloch pits I threw in there and, you know, <laughs> I gave it a low rating, but even though that it's a neural network, um, because it's quite unrealistic uh, compared to what we know about neurons. Uh, but all of these things are in the eye of the beholder, because even to this day, there are people who think that backprop can be implemented uh, in the brain. Uh, I'm not one of those people, but there are people like that. Um, and uh, so, yeah, this is something that we can kind of like talk about more uh, later. I would, I would disagree on Hodgkin Huxley for 0% behavioral. <laughs> I mean, maybe for human, but for, you know, oh, mm. for like, you know, small mm. creatures, worms, I think there's, Skelligans. it's probably greater than zero. Okay. <laughs> uh, this is, this is the, the first draft of this table. And yeah, no, I'm, I'm going to get input from you guys. On it's this. not the elegance. It's not even the elegance, exactly. The elegance has no spikes, so. Oh, right. <laughs> um, but yeah, and there's some things I really don't know that much about, like graphical causal models. And, you know, they clearly resemble some things that humans do. Um, but, you know, how far that goes, I don't really know. Go I, I give it 100 for interpretability because go good old fashioned AI is produced by interpretation this is like it can't not be interpretable <laughs> could you model a, a reflex like a knee-jerk reflex with a hodgkin huxley model is that something that's too complicated just it's only like two or three neurons right so you might be able to you probably have to add a lot of additional um in assumptions but yeah maybe you could um anyway so, so what Steve talks about, which is, which is nice because it's not often framed this way when people introduce machine learning. Like if you look at machine learning syllabi, it's interesting to see that they just launch into unsupervised learning and unsupervised learning and assume that the reader will understand why those are useful, but they don't talk about the fact that that's not the only way to frame this issue. There's a, there are things that are more about, that are interlinked. So, um, and you have all these different experiences, such as different types of dogs uh, that get labeled. Uh, you could, put, like before the name of the dog kind of comes in, you're already sort of grouping the things into various sorts. So this green thing I'm just saying is this implicit category that you're learning. And that's unsupervised. And then, uh, so, well, I need to come to that later. But, but so the, the, the supervised part is when you add the label and say, well, these things are dogs. And that can go very often. It's this feed-forward kind of uh, um, pathway that, that people use. 
And then this reverse direction, uh, which many models simply don't have, uh, is is what Steve kind of puts a lot of uh, you know thought into, which is the reconstruction of a template. Now, if you're watching, all, if you've paid attention to a lot of these deep learning things, you, there's all this stuff about super stimuli that maximally excite the representation of penguin, which doesn't look anything like a penguin. But even in situations where you get, well, this is the canonical face when I, or something like that. The way that they do that is not by kind of running the network backwards or even running the network at all. <laughs> what they're basically doing is starting with a guess and kind of iterating, iteratively uh, manipulating it, which is part of the principle behind adversarial networks. So I'm not saying all networks are like that, but a lot of the famous artificial networks don't actually have a reverse direction uh, for sort of unfolding what you've learned. So, so it's, it's, uh, it's sort of like a category that uh, can, cannot kind of unfold itself. Do you mean like when you say a wolf or a fox are not a dog or you decide they are a dog? Or is it more like when you decide a hyena is not a dog because it's really more like a cat? Well, it's, it's, it's beyond even the success failure. It's like this, that when I say the word wolf to you, you can actually produce uh, in some part of your uh, you know, neural networks um, a template of what a wolf is, is like. You can pull out the features. Um, so, uh, and that's not, you don't have to like start with some random drawing and sort of jiggle it around until you, you, you see something that maximally excites your uh, wolf representation. The wolf uh, symbol is mapped backwards to the wolf features. So, so, the, so you can sort of un 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 I unfold it. I was more asking about the variety. Like you have all these pictures of different kinds of dogs that look wildly different, right? And uh, a wolf, you know, looks more similar to a maybe a standard dog than many of these pictures and animals. So what's the, the schema for how a wolf would be considered not a dog, whereas all of these would be a dog? It, is it it wouldn't be purely unsupervised, right? Because if it were purely unsupervised, you would think a wolf is a dog. That's a good question. I don't. I, this, this relates a lot to art, to yeah. some of the logic in art map. So, so maybe, it's not there in art, but with art map, it um, that's that actually is one of the innovations. Is is um, um, is that that information comes into play? Yeah. Um, overlapping features and, and you're forcing the, the label to kind of keep things separate. There's a lot of stuff you can do. I'm not really going to talk about the art map, but, but yeah, that's, but these are the kinds of things preci precisely that, that motivate uh, Steve's way of thinking. Um, so another thing that Steve talks about, and, and when he's, especially when he's criticizing machine learning is catastrophic forgetting. And it's not just a Steve point. They've, they have started, they've been talking about it since the nineties too, so, which is this. When you've learned something like a cat categorization, why doesn't new learning overwrite old learning? You'd think that they would have solved something like this by now, but they haven't. Um, so I looked just on for some recent papers, and this is what I came, I saw as the solutions offered uh, in in a lot of the machine learning um, world. There's I call it. I'm being slightly dismissive here, but 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 the, the, these methods work to some extent. Fancy pre-processing, obviously that's not what they call it, but um, and hacky control of learning rates. This is like the big one. This is what everybody seems to want to do, like control whether you learn and when you learn, in in a in a kind of uh, not necessarily very principled way. There's also the thing called no the novelty rule, which I hadn't heard of outside of the Steve Grossberg kind of world, but it, it makes sense that someone would come up with something which, as we'll see, is a lot like um, what what Steve uh, is thinking about. So here's an example with some, some famous names uh, doing basically this. Uh, our approach uh, remembers old tasks by selectively slowing down learning on the weights important for those tasks. So it can work. And the more complicated you make something like this, like the more you kind of flesh out what you mean by important, the more it's going to resemble to some extent some of the things that are present in, in, uh, in art. Uh, and I, I just want to point out that this is told that, that this approach cannot ever solve the stability plasticity dilemma. Right, right. Um, so, so, what is there, the so there's another, there's, a, there's also some other methods like um, uh -huh. um, keeping learning in multiple locations. So if you temporarily learn in one location, you have a short term, short term learning, and then you have a long term location. 
and the long-term location is more stable mm -hmm. and the short-term location is less stable. And then you just need a process of moving, choosing, and this is actually like hippocampal cortical related, but right, right. moving some of the short-term short -term learning to the long-term location. Um, um, or, you know, learning in both at the same time and then using some kind of method to, to tag things. But it but it's actually better not to learn in both because then then you will have, you'll still have interference because you want um, so 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 having like an offline mode. So I I mean this is just my take on this. Um, but I think like things like related to sleep and hippocampal stuff is, is actually related to some pr proposed solutions, other solutions to uh, stability, plasticity, blah blah. Yeah, um, Steve's solution is a very clever one, but it, the brain probably uses all sorts of different, uh, like, bag of tricks. <laughs> um, uh, so, just, just, just to reinforce the general idea that Jesse was talking about, and this is unpublished research by uh, another lab, which I will only go over generally, but, you know, in even something as, as simple as a delayed saccade task, um, we know that in, uh, say, you're recording from LIP or FEF, that the uh, location of the delayed saccade is uh, the memory trace for cells that are in the receptive field of where you're eventually going to move your eyes, mm -hmm. um, stays there. It only stays there for around seven seconds, and then it disappears, but the monkey can still complete the task. And I will tell you that it shows up in an area very close to um, the hippocampus uh, just after seven seconds. And that memory trace is not present while it's being represented in the, in the um, parietal and frontal cortices. Hmm. Yeah, so there's a lot of like routing that goes on and we, don't, and we still aren't sure. There was a Tonegawa paper uh, suggesting that rather than hippocampal transfer, there's something weirder happening where there's some sort of learning that's happening in both prefrontal and, and hippocampus and the, the hippocampal learning was blocking the manifestation of learning in prefrontal cortex temporarily, which I find quite intriguing. Um, but yeah, that's another story. Um, so Steve's proposed solution is um, when new experiences are sufficiently unlike old categories, allocate new neural real estate to the new pattern. So uh, this leads to all kinds of issues for uh, the computation because you need to be able to say, this is new and then have a new, a fresh neuron in some sense, or a fresh ensemble to create a new implicit category. But that's what that's what this does. No, you have to have a fre fresh, uh, you have to have a, a sufficiently under-stimulated uh, right. yeah, set yeah. of weights. I mean, you don't need any new neurons to learn new categories under art. But you do need uncommitted neurons. So they, there needs to be this, this uh, and, no, and yeah, one I mean, thing I have not fully understood matter. is how. No, this gets back to what you were saying the last talk, is that neurons do not encode information. It's patterns of neurons that encode yeah. information. So that gives you a big common under -committed code. pattern. You don't need an undercommitted neuron or network or, right. I mean, and that's one of C's most important points, which is all of these other techniques require you to pre-allocate this right. state space that can be encoded. And under art, you do not need to pre-allocate the state space that you're going to encode because it can always absorb more states. And now this in, it involves more memory in a, you know, silicon computational sense in that you, your weight matrix gets bigger each time you add a category, but <laughs> It, it um, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's not a constraint. And especially when we think about how neurons work and, you know, the fact that the firing is very sparse, et cetera, et cetera, it's, it, it's really not a serious computational constraint from the point of view of what we know about what the brain can do processing wise. Right, there are some implementational issues which maybe we can talk about at the end because I'm, I've wondered a little bit about this. So. So adaptive resonance theory, what is it all about? The key idea is interaction between category nodes. These could be, they're basically what Nico just said, ensembles, groups, um, that, that they're not labeled categories, they're implicit learned categories. So we're doing unsupervised learning and feature nodes, which are the inputs, the, the form of the inputs, which two things can happen when, when you have this interaction. You can have resonance or a mismatch followed by reset and search. 
So we're going to look, explore now how all that works and what that means. So resonance means the features, which could be, you know, various low level, you know, parts of the face, if it's faces like no, you know, or something more low level, something higher level. So like if you're categorizing, if you're learning implicit categorization of chords, it could be the, the specific notes, it could be timbre, many things could be features. And the category note is the Im implicit that you've learned through experience. Oh, that's a major chord and that's a minor chord, even without anyone telling you that, that uh, they have labels. And the, 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 the implicit internal category node reinforces. And here's where that, we, when I said, when, in fact, I wrote reinforce there too, because Steve uses it and I replaced it with stabilize. So um, Steve doesn't use the language of attractors, but it's basically creating an attractor where when the category node agrees um, with the input in a sense that we will specify, uh, they mutually reinforce each other. So if you're doing stability analysis, which Steve doesn't necessarily show because he's so confident in his equations, but you could, for instance, have little perturbations and see whether just by jiggling something or adding a little bit of thermal noise, would the would I suddenly think a dog is a cat? No, this is a very stable system. Oh, oh, he shows, he shows, maybe not in this paper, he shows. He shows like, like perturbation analysis. Oh no no! To Steve, Steve and Steve Gale and Mike Cohen. Uh, done that. They've done that. That's with theorems. What I mean is like there was a Lyapunov. Yeah 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 exactly. That's what I'm saying. So when I said confidence in the equations, I meant that if you have the ability to do sort of pen and paper kind of math, you you can be convinced in a way that your reader might not be. Because I love to see like literal perturbation, like like um, simulated perturbation analysis, where you actually see a bump and see the thing return just because it looks cool you know well i just want to point out if you can get steve gale and mike cohen to all agree on something you're pretty sure that it's yeah true. you know i i'm not disputing it i'm saying for for other people who like the language of dynamical systems and attractors it would be nice to see it with, with in that way with, with perturbations in in a visual kind of way wasn't wasn't there the, the the this group of scientists who actually uh, this pair of scientists who actually implemented art two like fully continuously and showed that I don't remember what the yeah problem. yeah I actually tried to if 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 it's the same reference I actually tried to replicate it there's a Dutch there was a, a Dutch yeah. author yeah and um and I actually contacted her. I don't know if it was one author or two, I forget, but um, because I, certain parts of the system I couldn't get to replicate, but um, <laughs> I actually tried to <laughs> duplicate that. But yeah, totally dynamic version version of art with all, all dynamical systems, no, no algorithm to speak yeah, of. Because the, the nice thing is when you read about how art works, you feel as though you could quickly start implementing it, but then immediately you run into roadblocks. Um, okay, so... So, so I'm going to explain what these figures mean in just a sec. But the idea is that you have bottom-up information, feature-related, could be visual or auditory. That that let's assume it triggers some category node, and category nodes for the time being are mutually exclusive. How that happens, we've kind of seen already with the winner-take-all networks. Uh, it's basically that. Uh, and uh, so these are all partial pictures of what's happening in this network. So when uh, a category node is triggered, that um, to, uh, creates top-down excitation of a learned template back on the same uh, feature level, which is receiving the inputs. So the feature uh, nodes, the F1 layer, it's often called, is receiving two sets of excitatory input, uh, one from above and one from below. And the and we'll talk about more, the, the, the top-down uh, input is, is a bit more complicated. Um, so this is the basic story that that you have resonance between a category and the information that caused the category to be active in the first place, um, and and that can be tuned through learning, uh, so that you can adaptively shift um, which bottom up pattern um, is is re re resonates with a particular category node. So just because he uses these figures all over the place. Uh, and in the book, and sometimes it's, sometimes it's a little confusing if you haven't been working with this kind of highly condensed way of representing what a network is doing. So when you see this thingy on the, on the right, you should interpret it like this, that the height of it represents 
um, some sort of uh, persistent activity. And on, on the x-axis, if you want to call it that, um, it's the neuron number in, in some field. So there's just the juxt it's the arrangement in space um, or, uh, of, of neurons. That's all it really is. And a lot of connections are, are, are omitted, particularly inhibitory connections, because drawing all of them is virtually impossible. Um, so when you see that crown, you know what uh, it is. It's a pattern, hypothetical pattern uh, in, the, in a feature level or, or a category level. So, uh, so we talked about resonance, but, the, but in some sense way more conceptually interesting and important is a mismatch. So let's say that when you have a top-down input, you, uh, it's producing something that like it has a template. How it, how it de develops a template, we'll get to in just a sec. But let's say that I've, I see something and it's excited my implicit um, a, a boxer dog category. I have, it's not a named category, it's just something I've learned by experiencing various breeds of dog. And now I see this uh, half boxer, half Alsatian. And I'm like, well, so initially I think boxer, but then there's a, a moment where I'm like, what am I actually looking at here? Because uh, then when I kind of, having thought the, the in implicit category of boxer, uh, it, just, it doesn't quite sit, <laughs> there's some, something wrong here. Um, so, so what do you do then? Uh, you, you decide, and in the system it automatically says, well, based on the, the, the criterion of match, this isn't a good enough match, even though the category was activated. So then you basically need to say that's a, mis that's a mismatch and I'm going to um, try again. But what's clever here is that Steve uh, sort of metaphorically links this with something we've already seen, which is that denoising mechanism. So remember, uh, so we basically set, showed how this common mode suppression works. So you can pull out, if you have like flat input uh, in, an, uh, in, a, in a network, a competitive network, where all of, all of the nodes are receiving the same input, all of that can be suppressed so that the, the network produces no output. So Steve is saying, suppose we have uh, so there's a top-down template learned earlier, and uh, now there's an active category node, which does not really match well with the uh, bottom-up input pattern. And we'll get to what match well means, because that's crucial. Um, so in the worst case, uh, meaning the worst possible mismatch, which somehow has happened, the top-down template is complementary, that, that it's the opposite set of features from the, the bottom-up. So it's like where where it's active, the top the template is, is expects it to be inactive and vice versa. Uh, in that situation, you can imagine that you get a uniform pattern. And we already know from, our, from the recurrent competitive fields how to cancel that. So what I like about this trick, which is not actually how it's implemented, is that sort of metaphorically, you already know that if you can somehow create a balance in a, in a, in a network, you can silence it. So something sort of like that is what's happening in art, although it's not exactly like he describes it. Um, but so basically, if the template does match with what's in the feature, uh, which, is, which is live, the, like if I think, if my learned representation of what a boxer should look like, pick five, uh, and when that is sort of activated and sent back down, if it agrees with what I'm seeing, then you get a, a reinforcement of those features. They strengthen. So that's what's shown here in the, on the left of this bottom picture. Um, and, if they do, and if they don't agree, oh wait, sorry, I should read it that way, horizontally. Uh, and if they, if, they, if they don't agree, you get this flat kind of response, which can be suppressed. And if they do agree, they, they mutually uh, support each other. So, so mismatch is ba basically, the, the, the idea is that so somehow the feature level will be weakened by the mismatch but strengthened by alignment. And that's the resonance idea. Um, so yeah, the art matching rule works a little bit like this. I actually was trying to code this up on my own in Python and I found that it's not exactly what, what this figure says. It's a little different, but, and therefore a little harder to get working. But so now we can talk about the whole art circuit um, and the, the kind of conceptual uh, boxology. You have now this, so when he says STM, short-term memory, he means basically the, act, the firing. 
um, which the reason it's called short-term memory is because it could be like a trace, meaning that you present something briefly and then it's gone. So it's not necessarily something that's constantly present in the, in the outside, but, and, but it's retaining activity through hysteresis of some sort. So that's the short-term memory. Um, and so that sends uh, input to the category level and, and that's a winner-take-all network in the, in the simple versions. And that will uh, send excitation back down. When there's a match, everything aligns and you get this boost. Um, and the LTM is long-term memory and those are synaptic weights. So both the top-down and bottom-up weights are, are, are learned. Specifically when there's a match, and you might wonder why, when there's a, if you've already matched, why would I need to learn? The idea is that you can improve on your representation. So you have a kind of good enough category. And then as you, uh, as you experience more exemplars that kind of fit, you're sort of tweaking your representation. Um, so the idea is that uh, the, the, the feature le level is suppressing uh, an arousal signal. So you have an input coming in, that's, that's what's causing the feature level to be active. And that's exciting an arousal uh, node. It's a kind of low dimensional thing. It's just sort of summing up all the input. Like the fact that there's input means that that's a positive arousal signal. Um, and the, the feature level is suppressing it. The net, the way that you have to calibrate this is that uh, when you have a resonance between top and bottom, this inhibition from the F1 level to the arousal is strong enough that you're not aroused. So, so it's like it's like as if uh, ar uh, arousal is sort of constantly present whenever you're receiving any sort of signal, and it kind of becomes unmasked by uh, the mismatch, which is what uh, we'll see here. So, if there's a mismatch, that means that a lot a lot of cancellation happens. Uh, so, so things that uh, are in the feature node get suppressed. The top-down, it's not shown in this particular diagram, but the top-down effect is also inhibitory. It's not purely excitatory. Um, so, and it, so it controls local gain uh, uh, through an inhibitory mechanism. And so when there's a mismatch, you have uh, much less inhibition of the arousal system. So you're like, well, what? Uh, I thought I th was looking at a boxer, but it's not quite a boxer um, because uh, the thing that I was actually seeing didn't quite match with my expectation of what boxers look like. And that excites, basically disinhibits the arousal signal, which the arousal signal is sort of always receiving excitation whenever there's input. Um, and when there's a mismatch, it, it shows itself, basically. I, I would just oh. like to comment that you, you, we need to be very careful when talking about arousal in Steve's work. Yes, yes. Thank you for pointing that out. Between uh, tonic and phasic arousal. And what we're discussing here is phasic arousal. And uh, when we get into stimulus drive associations and, you know, the more reinforcement learning aspect of, of how we put the various arts that we have stacked on top of each other all over the brain, according to Steve, um, in the right context to interpret the signal. That this is, that, uh, that, that, that arousal means two very different things. And the type of arousal that you're talking about now, which is, you know, phasic arousal, you know, is, is um, Steve's explanation of both autism and schizophrenia, which I'm yeah, sure we come, we'll, we'll get to that very soon. Um, but so, I, I just uh, want to say that there's also a tonic arousal, which is really important and uh, sort of another aspect of, the, of uh, as Steve calls it, the turkey sex problem. I'll just leave <laughs> that as a teaser. Um, okay. uh, so uh, I would like to address uh, an issue that Kale raised earlier with respect to how do you uh, differentiate between these different types of dogs and wolves. Uh, uh, here is a schema already, even before going into art map, which will make it even more explicit because of the fact that you're going to make associations between the someone telling you that it is a wolf or a dog versus, you know, they're all, they're all looking the same. So you can see here kind of a schematic for how you might be able to differentiate not only between uh, wolf and dogs, but also 
finer categorization within dogs or any of that stuff is possible. We'll get to it even more so when Johan starts talking about vigilance, but we can already see here, right? Like depending on the pattern that you have in your F1, uh, which might be a, a, a pattern of different features coming in, it's always possible to th think that the wolf has slightly different patterns from those of the dogs, that that is sufficient enough to cause a reset in, so that's a mismatch enough that it can cause a reset so that you can start creating a new, you know, a category node at the top. So it's sort of like you can imagine that sort of schematically, but then once okay. you get into Perfect. vigilance yes, yes, or art map, it becomes much more explicit. You can in fact, wolf is a good example. So let's say that you like dogs and you've never experienced a wolf in your life and the wolf scares the daylights out of you. Uh, that will raise arousal in both the sort of model sense and in the colloquial sense. And then you become much more sensitive or vigilant in the, in the language of art to small differences. So, so you're, you're not just doing like a, a majority wins kind of feature comparison. It's more subtle than that. In some situations, some small part of the feature um, will become very important for the, the category. And other, other common features uh, will be kind of, kind of undervalued in the representation of the category mode. So just, under this, every time you see a dog or dog-like thing at all, every time you use this network, the network is changed. Every single stimulus changes every future stimulus. Uh, no. If uh, you if if you're well within the the cat the match, and there's not much change between uh, uh, between the template and what you already and what you're seeing, then you won't change much. But it's kind of lifelong learning in that sense. But so, what are you thinking of Nico? So so well okay. Just to respond to this question, the Barbara Moore paper that I put in at the beginning explains this better than anything else that I've ever ever seen. But um, there there I mean. The one of the points of vigilance is it puts a threshold on learning. Yes, we'll get to that very soon. <laughs> okay. um, um, yeah. and, and then the second thing I just wanted to say in defense of Waltz is there has been an outstanding prize issued in Canada since 1892 or something of anybody who can show an unprovoked wolf attack on a person <laughs> that is still unclaimed. Well done. <laughs> so, you know, I think there's a lot of cultural yeah, um, yeah, yeah. weight into demonizing wolves, but actually they're... 100%, yeah. They, they'll I... attack your chickens or your pigs, but they won't attack you. Somebody... Can, can I, yeah, sorry. Can I, can I ask a, a question? I don't want to um, follow that pro wolf um argument which because i'm definitely pro wolf um so no my question was about this little arrow from the a so yes. as you know we've, we've talked about before the arousal system um is quite complicated and lots of different moving parts and i'm just really curious to know what kind of functional role it's playing in terms of the model architecture is it just like a signal boost for f2 uh is it anything sort of upstream like so if there's a a mismatch at f1 and therefore the arousal node gets disinhibited is it just that anything upstream and if so is it everything upstream or is it f2 to f4 good, good. but it doesn't go beyond it i'm just curious to know that's that's the right. question and and the 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 sort of opening out of where it can leak elsewhere is is not mm. addressed here but but what what i will say is that it's more complicated than pure boosting or pure inhibition because, and, and this is something that I've been thinking about a lot, you need to inhibit the current category, but you don't want to inhibit the ability to produce categories in general because you still want some category. So you, mm. can't, just say sh you can't just shut off everything. So you, you, you need have a hypothesis test for other yes, good that, matches. That's precisely what he calls it. It's a I was thinking about test. like, like a, you, know, you know the uncanny valley that you get when, um, you guys ever heard of that before where like, um, avatars when they're really really cartoony we don't really care so if they've got the Simpsons we don't care at all but if they start to look a little little bit too much like humans we're not quite right it just makes us feel super gross like um, think of like all the animatronics that were done back in like the mid 90s yeah. I was just I'm thinking of this because my my youngest son just watched Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 Secrets of the Ooze <laughs> and um, the animatronics in that are just garbage and awful compared to modern day stuff. And it makes you feel so creepy because you know something's wrong. You know that lips ought not to move just like that or that when people wink, it ought not to cause half of their face to collapse or something. But it does because that's what they could do at the time. 
Um, and, but yeah, you can't quite put your finger on it. So there's all these prediction errors flying around the system because of the imprecision of a, I guess, a prediction. Anyway, I just, I was just trying, yeah. to, trying to think about this a little bit. I like this a lot because, like, um, I, I'm sure Steve has like thrown this in somewhere in one of his more emotion-like related papers. But, but the idea that that being uh, sort of baffled by something within a particular categorization system could have knock-on effects elsewhere is is not. I mean, everybody can relate to that. Like <laughs> that, that that and and so meaning that you don't need a novelty signal or an unexpected event to be specific to what you were attempting in order for you to kind of reset. Um, so I, I like this. I, I don't know. I mean, maybe Miko and, and Karthik will know of specific places where the arousal is having knock-on effects in other parts of the network that, that didn't produce a mismatch. Um, we can chat about some of this stuff off, offline. I, I've got some specific yeah. questions, but maybe just keep rolling. But, but yeah, the, I, I haven't put too much in here, but I, I thought once we get a kind of overview of, of like the, the mismatch thing, uh, it's easier to kind of understand what how vigilance like helps and whether it like has a knock-on effect. I think it probably does in some situations, but, and some of the disorder stuff, when we talk about that, it might be relevant as to when you're locked into one particular task, not being distracted by a task irrelevant mismatch is kind of, it can happen to people. So, so just to kind of zoom in on, on what, a category, what happens to a category node, uh, here, okay, let's say some input comes in, it's, it's ex exciting the uh, arousal, but, it, but here's, but I think, uh, potential match. So you get inhibition of that signal. But if there's a mismatch, then there's insufficient excitation in the F1 and the feature uh, uh, layer. So you get this boost uh, and then uh, you shift to a different category. So that's the search kind of cycle, which is that if, if this one's not good enough, move to another one uh, because that one has been suppressed as a result of this arousal signal. So there's a little bit of kind of machinery you need to build in to the arousal because it's low dimensional and it can't know uh, from its low dimensional perspective, well, who was the, who was the wrong party in this? Which category node messed up here? Uh, all it knows is that one of them did. And, and so it's careful to kind of not assume too much on the part of the, of the arousal signal. See, um, that's really so nice, Johan, because that's where things like the Rowan Ballad predictive kind of coding model can get a little bit hairy because prediction errors there are quite precise. I made a mistake. Where should I go looking for the answer rather than something's wrong, quick, give me some new hypotheses about what else it could be. And then hopefully the evidence that is present, the context, maybe you missed some subtle detail in the context. Now all of a sudden that can push your um, pattern match, your art or whatever, your resonance to a slightly different solution. Yes. And now you're like, oh, well, clearly it was just that whole damn time. Exactly. Um, and so, so I think this actually makes way more sense biologically yeah. and has less of a ghost in the machine than exactly. a lot the, of the, current, current common popular models. And, that, and that's the thing, but like the places where he puts low dimensional signals, they're really well motivated. Uh, uh, and I, so, like, so even if you have to make something, you have to tweak a bunch of things to, to make it more plausible for what we currently say about some circuit. Um, the fact that those things are low dimensional is something to pay attention to, like we, we take to and take seriously. I, I had okay. a question about this map. Um, each one of those nodes is not like a, a neuron or a group of neurons or like an anatomical region. It's more of a conceptual node of like a pattern of activity. Is that, am I understanding that right? Right, but it needs to be able to do this. So it's it's like, like the way it's implemented is it might, it, it's like a rate. So it could be a, a an ensemble of neurons. But, I, um, but it, it needs to be able to, be the sort of entity that is in a on center of surround network. Um, so I think I think that Johan's next slides are going to answer your question because that is in. Oh yeah, when we talk about the learning, it'll it'll be clear what I'm talking about also. So so instar and outstar are 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 how the learning uh, actually takes place. Uh, so here I'm just showing how you unfold the instar. Why why are they called that, for instance? So here he's put three layers on there just to make it clear because the idea is that you can keep stacking these on top of each other, these layers where each one is 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 uh, art, like each pair is like an art system. So the out star just means a fan art. Um, so you can understand that as a node that can recreate a whole higher dimensional pattern. So it's like going from a one dimensional um, activity to some larger pattern. And the instar is the opposite, which is basically a detector. It, it's looking for a pattern and saying, yes, that's the pattern. Uh, 
that I like. And so, so uh, these these actually are neurons or groups of a similar neuron type. Each node right. is, and this one is very explicitly neurons. Right, right. So, so which are neurons, should be an ensemble also. Uh, I think the right word to use is ensemble. Yeah, it's very unlikely that it'll be. And I think that making uh, like doing a kind of of, of almost dead. Darwinian things is like you start with some idea and then make use the variability to actually add functionality uh, is something I've I've been thinking about as a way to maybe Steve's already done a version of this but it's like takes take a group of neurons that are representing a single category and what if they kind of hybridize so that so 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 you can get like some of them continue to represent the, the category at a particular level and others sort of migrate to different aspects or parts or even levels of granularity. But how to get that to work with the exact same algorithm is, is another issue, but that's sort of just a so, speculative so, idea. So the only, the only time that Steve gets away from ensembles is when we start getting into fast laminar and uh, which is a Rashi Osdenbach and uh, you know, the, and the work that Jesse and Max did where and then Young Chow. definitely sells. Young Chow too. Yeah. So yeah. So so they're they're units, they're abstract units, but they behave uh, a lot like we think. At least they're whatever it is that can fit into recurring competitive fields. And neurons can do that if they're very reliable. But you have to make some assumptions about connectivity. Johan, you should have made the the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the the uh, perceptual contour version of the old star. <laughs> I thought about it, but <laughs> then I forgot. Um, okay. So so what is being learned? Uh, this is something that 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 Steve doesn't explicitly say because he probably finds it super obvious. But but uh, so so these are the two types of learning. Uh, as you can see, the outstar is going to be uh, in place for the top down uh, learning of a template. The instar is going to be in place for the learning of the for the category in order to be sensitive to some pattern in the bottom up. But what exactly is the learning law? It's very simple. It's not. It you know, the the differential equation itself is pretty straightforward. Um, Here's just an example of the type of thing that, that uh, Steve keeps adding complexity to, but at, at base, it's just this, that the synaptic connection weight linking, in this case, the presynaptic to the postsynaptic uh, has two important two terms. There's the weight keeping track of some function of the, of the presynaptic activity. It could just be the activity itself, but sometimes you transform it. And this, in this case, a postsynaptic gating, which, sort of allows the system to learn in the first place. Uh, and how that gating is chosen and what you put in there, it can be postsynaptic, it can be presynaptic, it can be both post and presynaptic. There's a lot there um, that you can do. So, so there's an asymmetry. Outstar is presynaptically gated, but instar is postsynaptically gated. And- So you uh, would have an equation for each line, um, each edge in the graph, right? Yes. Okay. Um, we can, vectorization helps a lot here. <laughs> Uh, so it's it's very easy to to generalize that way. Um, so I just plugged in the form of this equation into Wolfram Alpha to see what what the solution looks like, or if there was one that could be expressed. And so here uh, in this, the f is just some generic gating variable, and h is some input. And uh, what you get, uh, the one uh, I asked actually, I can't think is good at this sort of thing, so I asked him to just check if this was okay and derive it. And so basically you can interpret this, like this, this is an interpret, however complicated it looks if you're not comfortable with integration. This is essentially, um, would anyone like to describe what this is? Uh, like like uh, what is W keeping track of? Uh, one way you can talk about it is that it's an exponentially weighted running average. So just looking at that again, and you can convince yourself that this equation, now if like if I, like you could simulate this, to, I actually just simulated it just to convince myself, even though you can look at the form and see what it's doing. So suppose I, I say hypothetically that my gating term and X are binary values. They just have take one or zero and they are sort of randomly happening at, at various times. So occasionally when there's a coincidence where G is happening along with X, then only then does the weight change. Uh, and if I have a slow enough learning rate, then what am I doing? I'm basically computing uh, the conditional probability. Um, it's an estimate of the conditional probability of X given G. So 
in some like so it's a very interpretable quantity and it's sitting there as a synaptic, synaptic weight in general it won't be so easily interpretable because x and g need not be nice neat events so, but it, you'll always be able to interpret it as an exponential uh, running average so in the case of uh, the the example that johan has given with them being instantaneous binary values it kind of like reduces to a conditional probability but you have to be very careful because here in in all of steve's model the uh, the assumption is not about any instantaneous binary variables f and h are uh, continuous functions so you want to think of the overall trajectory of what the synaptic weights are doing is basically uh, i mean it is doing this exponential weighted running average what it's doing is it's actually doing this whole idea of what steve would call as an adaptive filtering where it's basically doing a function approximation of both the f of and the h of function so that's kind of basically what uh, the uh, learning law ends up being so it's it's whatever the post synaptic filtered whatever processed output that's the f of x post and the h of x pre so it's kind of you can also think of it as the hebbian learning that happens of complicated inputs and outputs only when the weight change needs to happen so you, that's an alternative way to frame right, right. that's what the gating actually does but i just thought it's, it's fun that this is sitting in there and it's not often pointed out that because when you're doing some something more punctate for instance it becomes a little bit like counting and and averaging some sort of running count uh, and so so very often when people look at synaptic learning laws they're like what am i looking at but nice to have this as like one of the things sitting in there obviously the le learning learning laws are more general so like what kartik said it's you can't always interpret it that way but that part that might help to start thinking about what a synaptic weight can keep track of under this type of learning law i i i just want to bring up another way of interpreting this since you know i didn't do any learning models with steve i did you know um models that were pre-learned um which which is that you know in in all of the pre-learned models um you know you have these sigmoidal functions that control the transfer of information from one area to another and um and one way to think about that is you know sigmoid can be a, a soft sigmoid or can be a very sharp function even approximating you know a heavy side function and that one way to think about this is, is if you think about it in terms of temperature um, in the mechanical sense that, um, you know, the, 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 the whole idea of vigilance in these learning rules is that if you have, if, if you're very sure, if you're on the flat sides of the function, no learning should occur. And vigilance is controlling how steep your curve is at some level. And that you should learn on the curve, but not at the sides. Mm. And I'll get back into this in a different context <laughs> later on in, in the, in the um, book. <laughs> so, so this is uh, this is the thing that that uh, I like to think about, which is that in an equation like this, it's that that term just seemingly sitting there hanging out. Like like if you were, when you do what we were doing in the dynamical systems uh, discussions, is we set the derivative to zero and see where it tends, right? That won't actually tell you anything in these kinds of situations, where you're <laughs> because because the gate is crucial <laughs> to to what um to what actually gets learned uh, so that's where you can get effectively conditions uh where you know and like processing this and this and this need to be the case and i'm, I'm averaging on that condition which is a really nice way to think about what's in app so you could think uh, to, to take this in a, the most radical way is that the the numerical accuracy of the brain could lie only in the synaptic weights and not in the activity in the firing activity and I suspect that that's an interesting, I mean, at least that's an interesting way to think that when we are numerically accurate, that isn't reflected necessarily in the spiking or firing rates, things like that, but in something sort of deeper that gets queried in a way. Uh, so yeah, in, in this case, since we have competitive learning, uh, that gate is, is they're going to be mutually exclusive. So it's like one thing learning at a time. Uh, and so that's where that recurrent competitive field really kind of kicks in to say, well, this is what's learning this template, this pattern now to improve its template. Uh, okay, so now uh, we talked about basically what's happening here with arousal. And um, so Johan, before you, before you go on, I just wanted to ask about your definitions of symbols and representations. Are you gonna 
touch tie that in more explicitly with these yeah network I put that at the end because that's like the the, the unending kind of uh, thing but, uh, okay. but right now because right now we're, we're very humbly just talking about cat the sorts of categories that are least complicated and which often some people won't even call symbols even though and there's something you, you, you yeah we'll get there yeah. so, so right now you're talking about category categorization essentially right this yeah, whatever, is a categorization network yeah whatever can learn uh, a like like can be sensitive to a vector and if, if you don't want to think about it as a vector it's basically uh, like some um, group average of multiple features. It's, it's, so think of, yeah, think of ultimately just averages. Like it's not that, like what this weights are doing is not that complicated, but what's nice is that, um, but it's an average conditional on like, it's like the average that this category node saw. So basically when I, my boxer category is on, it won't get contaminated by Al Alsatian when the learning is going well. And then when I see the half boxer, half Alsatian, uh, uh, if I'm if my vigilance is sufficient, uh, then I'll say, well, this is something I've never seen before. But these are just categories. Uh, Steve definitely thinks this, and I think it's at least part of the story that you need to sub, uh, build symbols on top of this. And he has some ideas about if the learning if then rules and conditionals, but I, I'm not I'm not too familiar with how he cashes all that out. So, so yeah, we talked about this not good enough thing, and 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 this needs a lot of elaboration. Um, so when you have a mismatch, what does it mean? And, and, and not good enough sounds subjective, right? Where does that subjectivity come in? The idea is that it's the top-down inhibition. So the top, the top-down uh, node is doing two things. It's specific excitation of features according to the outstar, um, which is ex exciting of, uh, basically, like if you think about the, what the weights have learned is like the, it's like the average dog is being uh, excited and then you're basically comparing what comes in with the average of that of uh, average boxer for instance and and when there are you know discrepancies you you're basically adding them all up uh, and, and if there are too many discrepancies the the way that it's all set up is that the top down inhibition which is non specific uh, dominates over uh, the excitation and that unleashes this arousal so the threshold for when the arousal actually happens is this one dimensional parameter vigilance, which, which is super useful. Um, and so how that kind of comes in is that just to flesh out what, what, what uh, the same kind of mechanism is that the F2, the category node is giving these two kinds of input. There's the excitation of the specific features of its template. And then there's this inhibition of, of gain control, which is kind of a multiplicative factor. And so in order for a feature uh, level to be active, kind of supra threshold, it needs two out of three inputs to be active. At least, so it's kind of like either my bottom up and my top down excitation really agree, or there's some supplementary kind of attentional boost that's kind of forcing me to pay attention to things that are actually kind of discrepant, uh, which could be useful in some situations where you're where like learning something that's like a very subtle category or you're forced to, to be, you're, you're told or you, you learn that this really is a part of that other category. So there's ways of kind of uh, overcoming uh, that inhibition. So that's the matching. And, and I think there's, it's a little bit of like, it's difficult to get it to work right. And it'll, that's where a lot of the tweaky stuff kind of comes in. Um, so that third one would be like a penguin really is a bird, even though you didn't think it was. <laughs> yeah, like right? somebody assures you. No, no, no. But that would be more in a in a supervised learning context. But again, he's put this in there, knowing that it will be useful somewhere else, not necessarily for the pure unsupervised learning here. Um, and, and you know, it's like a hook for something else to latch onto. Uh, so yeah, uh, here's the 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 kind of real detail of it. Um, so each active F1 node generates an inhibitory signal of fixed size to A, A being the arousal signal. And so the bottom-up input, it's a pattern I. And so the total input of, uh, is, is giving, if you look at A, the, the input as a vector is exciting the feature node, but as a sort of low-dimensional clump is exciting the arousal. And uh, the vigilance controls the ratio of of, of excitation to inhibition, basically, inside the arousal signal. So that determines how off 
uh, you need to be in order to unleash the arousal. It's, very, it's, it's really nice because it's so low dimensional. And even though they initially implemented algebraically, it's fairly straightforward to implement this um, as uh, as itself uh, a neural. And they've done that in, in subsequent versions of this. Um, so uh, modeling this as, for instance, acetylcholine or some other uh, um, neuromodulator, it's just sitting there. Uh, the, the, the trick really is getting the time, time scale right um, for how long you want the arousal to be on because you because that will reset everything and and cause a certain duration of, of inhibition and all those te temporal parameters will be will matter a lot so uh, a different way of talking about vigilance in, in purely sort of machine learning -y way is to say that the lower your vigilance the coarser the the the, the, cate the granularity of categorization and as you kind of like uh, have like like perfect vigilance you will be able to differentiate every boxer from every other boxer as well. And they will all be assigned unique names and whatnot. So uh, that's like the more uh, gentle. So, the, so you can- And I'll get, I'll get to uh, some examples uh, like about that. Uh, just I'd just like to point out that there is no perfect vigilance. Perfect. <laughs> I, 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 I... <laughs> sure. <laughs> no, no, yeah. no. In, in the sense that the whole point is this is an explanation of lossy data compression, which the brain has to do. Yeah. And w when your vigilance is higher, you're in the comp in the silicon sense, you're spending a lot more memory to um, put in more information. Mm -hmm. And that the whole point of vigilance is that you are only spending enough bits to um, to retain the information that's behaviorally relevant. Yeah. And that's a really, really important point, which is that sometimes you wanna expend no bits of new information. Um, because there's, I mean, when I'm walking the, you know, down the street to the subway to, to go to work, um, I mean, does my brain have to be doing a lot of things? Do I have to cross streets safely, et cetera? Yes. Uh, do I want to specifically retain any specific memory of that? No, it's a total waste of time. I've done it, you know, several thousand times before. So, so I mean, this, this idea of what gets committed to long-term memory, you know, is really important in the context of successful behavior. Yeah, and what's nice about this is that it's a one-dimensional, just to, like a knob, which I'll get to it just a sec. Uh, but but just to to like because the reset part it's a little conceptually tricky uh, to to imagine that I only want to su suppress the, the current winner but not everybody. So so, so I, I just want to I just want to also you know say that this is a this is a um, generalization or an extension of featural noise suppression, which is to say that the absolute limits <laughs> level gets repressed which is what is totally predictable given your current state of knowledge is useless to you in the sense that you don't need to change your representations or change. I mean, that, that you don't need to modify that. And so the, one of the key points of vigilance is that when the outside environment matches your expectations for what's happening given your behavioral goal, no learning should occur, no extra computation should occur, no extra energy should be expended. It's only when those expectations uh, yes. are violated that the brain really has to swing into gear and the whole attentional framework and everything else has to figure out what just happened that I didn't predict. As so long as everything aligns with your, your expectation, nothing should change. So, the, so, so that helps a lot in that situation. So yeah, the vigilance controls this this threshold. Um, and so, but the question I was thinking was like, how does this failed category, the one that produced this mismatch, get sent off into the corner? Uh, so the answer I haven't gone into it in detail, but it's just interesting to know conceptually because you can all you can kind of if you're making a kind of algorithmic version, you can come up with various ways to do this. But the system needs to inhibit the category level selectively. The winning node should be inhibited, but not everything else. So how would you achieve this? Um, <laughs> habituative gating is, is his answer and something called depressive synapses. So you have transient global inhibition of the entire categorical level, but by virtue, like the thing that was active is kind of like getting tired almost. So, so that when it then, when input is received again, it's like timed out. It's like, okay, you have eaten enough, stop eating. 
uh, and that's a locally, and that can be locally computed. Again, nicely kind of um, the global local kind of thing is nicely placed here. But, but if you are doing this in a purely algorithmic way, it's 101 ways you could do this. Um, okay, so this is what, what, uh, what, what everyone was kind of wanting to get to, which is that increased vigilance uh, takes you from lumber to split up, which is a term that anatomists uh, often use. And uh, I thought it was really funny. Um, there's a Wikipedia page on lumpers and splitters and this Charles Dar apparently Charles Darwin was the first person to use this term in writing. And his, his phrase is hilarious. It is good to have hair splitters and lumpers. <laughs> That's just like so blank, but, but sure, yeah. Nice to have both, <laughs> but but yeah. So so it's it's what's nice about having one dimensional knob is that depending on on your needs and all kinds of other things, which you can uh, make subject to to control, you can have the very broad category of hey, this is music. To you know, have, if any of you have ever seen many many sub 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 genres of heavy metal, which people can apparently distinguish. Um, and this kind of relates to this concept uh, that Alan Moss talks about uh, the, the prickles in goo or goo and prickles in this, uh, that, that there are these personality types, some people who want to make sharp distinctions and everything is precise and, and the goo is like, well, all is one and you know, all that kind of vague uh, way of thinking. And, and flexibility requires a little bit of being able to move um, in, within, within and across context. So here's where the, the, the kind of, link uh, to, to symptoms of various disorders and, and uh, just general abnormalities comes in. That, and here you have to be careful because people don't want to call this necessarily a disorder anymore, but you know, it's some versions of autism are clearly disorder states, but hyper, hyper, um, hyper categorization is, is kind of also a sort of super superpower in some situ situations. It uh, can be quite good for people to have that. But the idea is that hyper, that aligns nicely with the idea of of having higher than normal vigilance. So you can have narrow focus. It could be really useful in certain situations, particularly in very safe situations. Um, and there's a lot of indirect evidence, anatomical, physiological, that some version of this story can tie in uh, not with, with other, other ideas like intense world hypothesis and stuff like that. So your the kind of positive feedback loop is increased uh, also potentially. And then on the other extreme, Steve doesn't actually talk about this too much, but I know that uh, overgeneralization and and has been associated with some some forms of schizophrenia. So, so this I just found a paper on this that you have on uh, and and a lot of people have talked about schizophrenia and autism as being on a single spectrum. There are there's comorbidity and things like that, so you have to like be careful here. Uh, it's not a simple one line from one to the other, but it, but it's like a a way to start thinking about it. Um, so patients make overly simplistic interpretations of the states of minds of others. Specifically, that type of overgeneral simplification and overgeneralization is interesting. Um, and it's related to flattened affect, social withdrawal, chronicity, and uh, this other idea, overgeneralization of hypotheses. So, so you could, and in a more sort of rich kind of situation where you're talking about swings in behavior from like maybe depression to mania, you could have overgeneralization happening temporarily or modality specific. Like you could have overgeneralization, very broad categories in the case of depression, um, where your, your vig vigilance for uh, bad things happening is quite low. And so you, so rather than thinking of every day as its own separate thing, you might think, well, days in general are horrible. Uh, and then every time, and if you have a very large category on which you are subsequently doing reinforcement learning, then it's like a double punishment because not only are you mistaking situations that are different, but then everything get, uh, gets sort of like all the bad stuff is voting in, in this big bucket. So it's almost like a self-fulfilling kind of um, prophecy of badness in that situation. So... Steve links this with neuromodulation and specifically the basal forebrain. But I think uh, if, if you, uh, it could be that all of the neuromodulators are, are you know, partly operating to change vigilance and some of these other parameters, like how strong the excitation is. Because any of these things, if you change the inhibition or the excitation, will, if you think about it, change uh, what the vigilance does. So there's many, many degrees of freedom <laughs> that could, uh, could effectively 
uh, like if you if we assume that the vigilance model is right because there's a lot of assumptions underneath that and that it works this way that uh, a, a good match somehow suppresses your arousal nice thing there is that it's a very stark difference between a bayesian predictive model and an active and so even though they call that act, uh, active inference this is kind of more active because the match has to be manifest you, you can't just cancel out everything so the the the, the sort of top down uh, input can't just be uh, error cancellation because you actually want the match to be positively manifest uh, in order to suppress uh, arousal uh, coming up and steve has an interesting suggestion in this context that that um, novelty seeking be behaviors uh, might be related to uh, an, an alzheimer's that so ach dynamics can be boosted by um, curiosity and things like that and, and so it's a hard in this particular uh, situation the co correlation causation kind of they go in both directions potentially uh, that if you're naturally curious and seeking novelty you get the benefit and maybe if you naturally produce a certain uh, level of, of, of this or you're particularly responsive to novelty that can have uh, that can influence both your behavior and the neuroprotective side of things. This is just Steve indirectly signaling about his uh, uh, collection of uh, rare and different uh, African masks and how he can't live without them. That's all it is. So, <laughs> yeah, so Steve's a collector. Um, but, but yeah, these, these are these are like, I think, pretty speculative and at this point you have to ask well how, how you know how much does it really uh, constrain the, the neurobiology but but it, but it, it, it helps you articulate certain hypotheses that you might not otherwise think very directly which is the link between neuromodulation and something seemingly quite um, sort of you know machine learning which is sizes of categories so bolting those two things together and then viewing not just perceptual symptoms but other symptoms in terms of size of category is, I think, a useful thing to do uh, in because uh, it like helps you think more about both behavioral and neural hypotheses. So, Johan, maybe this is a good good time to, to bring this back up now. Um, yeah, I'm almost done, yeah. So I think um, this is where it gets kind of really interesting to, to think about the um, heterogeneity and, and sort of specificity of projections and receptive expression and things like that in the um, in the neuromodulatory system, because there are some, like the, the, the general idea I, I quite like of like an arousal system that's um, got a capacity to be firing quite high, but is kept under wraps when things are relatively going to plan. I think that's a really lovely idea. And I think that makes a lot of adaptive sense for animals, right? If, if you're an animal and you've learned that, you know, this is a good place to get food, you might as well just keep getting food from there. Um, unless something happens that deviates from your prediction, then you should like, maybe the food runs out or you start to smell a predator, you should get the hell out of there, right? So that, this makes an awful lot of sense to me. Um, but a lot of the devil's in the details about how the, uh, the neuromodulatory system, I'm assuming is the sort of main hypothesis for this arousal hub can influence and interact with the rest of the brain. And as we've talked about before, there's a lot of nuance there about presynaptic versus postsynaptic expression about different receptor types about whether or not the receptor type um, ends up causing an inhibition or an excitation internally within the cell in terms of second messengers. I've been reading a little bit recently about the fact that you can get these weird things where the context of the activation of a particular receptor can change whether or not the internal effect is excitatory inhibitory. This happens a lot in the hypothalamus. So depending on whether or not you've eaten lots of food um, and have certain chemicals like leptin floating around can change whether or not an MC receptor is a GI or a GS type, which can then affect whether you increase or decrease cyclic AMP. And so you can have all these really, really, really complicated nonlinear effects. And so just saying that, and I don't ever think that, I don't mean to sort of suggest that you're saying that that's how the A, the arousal chemical um, value has to work in these models, but just saying that they work by changing the gain of one upstream circuit is, is like a first approximation and very, very simple compared to the way that the brain has probably solved it. And so in other words, there could be way more in there about what you could do, the subtlety with which you could change the signals. And, and it could differ across the hierarchy of the of the brain in, in many different ways. Anyway, it sounds like you've already- uh, Because this. like I have, and this is a, a, a criticism of, of this type of modeling in general, that, that it's, 
it, some, it seems to under constrain a lot of things that we do know about local circuitry. So at the, at best it can be, and it's almost like when, you, when you're a modeler and you start approaching the molecular stuff in particular, it's like all the things that we assume are little parameters like learning rates and non-linearities and re EI ratios and things like that, that we just sort of put in there are all subject to multi-dimensional kind of control from these kinds of processes that you just mentioned. So, so it fits in with the, the research program of progressive and uh, like elaboration that uh, that you know, Steve's version of it is, and, and in some sense, you know, Paul Cisek's version of it. We like, it would be really cool to have a project that does both, right? Which is that you have hypothetical models of, you know, up in Paul's uh, phylogenetic tree and then make a little Grossbergian model of it because the early ones will be easy to make, right? And and then you can ask uh, when so I- So Grossberg's vehicles. Them, <laughs> like Breitenberg's yeah. vehicles, yeah, but yeah. Grossberg, yeah. So, but uh, this is obviously not a good answer to your question in the sense that we would like to have more constraint, we don't. And here I think yes. you have to be a bit more, what's that frame and, frame and Dyson term, the birds and the frogs? Like, like you need people who are both. And I, I'm, I like to be a frog too. I really like diving into the details uh, on, on the ground level. And then that sometimes changes how I think a mechanism will work. Uh, mm. But having these, like it's, and so I actually have a point to make later that these are all rational reconstructions, not so much of what the brain is doing as what the mind is doing. Uh, or, and including the unconscious mind. So you have to always keep that in mind. However much neural clothing it wears, on some level, it's just this rational reconstruction. Um, so so I, I, I just also want to interject on that, which is, so, so Steve has a big set of work on the hypothalamus that was done in the early 80s um, that nobody reads and it was published in strange journals. Uh, and, um, you know, one, one of the key things about the stimulus drive association that I brought up a few times before is that there are corollary signals being sent out to all of these uh, hypothalamic regions um, that are involved in drive control, whether it's appetitive, uh, whether it's circadian rhythms, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, they can all inform themselves in a very low pass filtery sort of way of what's going on, you know, moment to moment. And they can change their behavior and they can take control of the situation when necessary if they have, have to have a phasic spike. So, um, you know, when, when, when thinking about, you know, thing, things like this, I, I, I mean, these, these systems, I mean, we, we know now from, say, Susan Demecki that, you know, the serotonin system has eight different components to it. I mean, it's, 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 there's, first of all, there's more fine grainness than you think. And second of all, um, you know, these, these systems under Steve's framework really modulate what arousal is because arousal is not just, you know, what your heartbeat, you know, is it's, it's, you know, it's, um, how worried the systems that are tracking reward prediction errors or can track reward prediction errors, how in error are they? And when they get more and more in error, they get more and more excited to try to get the rest of the brain to try to figure out why the hell they're experiencing this. Yeah, um, I guess, you know, it's the funny, it's the thing that people wanted to, to like, kind of hoped almost that the neuromodulators and things like the hypothalamus were super low dimensional. And then you find, oh, wait, they're not actually that low dimensional. So, so it's like this bouncing back and forth. And then, but the, the hope is that, that when you add variety, so it's a little bit like uh, with this classic move in biology, right? Because you start by positing something that's a constant. And then you say, actually, that's part of a distribution. And the distribution isn't actually taking away anything is actually adding functionality. That, that's like the way to be optimistic about it, which is that things that seem to almost be moving in opposite directions um, can actually independently contribute and give you some more flexibility. That's, you know. So I have a question about. about the arousal signal. So the only example that we worked with was when you look at something and internally un in an unsupervised way, you know that what you look at is not an example of the category you thought it might be, right? So you look at this thing or you experience something, you think it's part of the category, 
no, your brain internally already says, makes the comparison and says, no, it's not part of the category. And then you get the arousal signal saying, what, what to do next? Let me compare to another category or let me think about this in a new way, right? That's the main gist of it. Yeah. How That doesn't seem like the word arousal that I'm used to in the sense that Mac is using of like uh, a supervised feedback that says, uh-oh, something's happened. What's going on? I better pay attention. That's that's the sort of stereotypical cognitive it's neuroscience it's arousal. Not supervision, but just reinforcement learning. So like, and again, like, the, uh, uh, the what's the difference between reinforcement nature of the and feedback? supervision it's not the same so thing supervised learning is explicitly giving you a label and sometimes uh, uh like an like a like even a template sometimes but but reinforcement learning is just saying good bad and sometimes only just good or just bad and so you're you're learning in uh, internal representations of what to do um based on the ultimate low dimensional signal well, as supervised learning, uh, you, you can actually say, give labels. Uh, and so just in practice, it's very different how you implement them in machine learning and even in, in neural models. The, because the, the reinforcement signal is punctate, right? So there's this thing called the temporal credit assignment problem, which is that the reward or the punishment could come much later uh, compared to the thing that actually was instrument, was crucial. So you could have all this backward conditioning and things like that. So, so the thing that you implement when you're implementing reinforcement learning will be different, but those can be arousing just fine. But Steve is always using like any word that Steve uses, you have to assume is not the mainstream, the uh, biological way that people would understand it. So it's, it could in some situations be. So in, in art, arousal. also, so, so your question relates to your previous question. So it's really, as Johan mentioned, this is about, this is about supervised learning, not unsupervised. And so that's with ArcMap. And there's something in ArcMap called match tracking, which means you, 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 um, <laughs> you, you take, you take your, begins. yeah, you, you actually affect your arousal based upon how well the categorization happens. So it's an, it's an added layer. Uh, it's an added additional processing that, that still fades into that same system, but more of a top-down way of saying like, okay, let's reset let's reset in the same way. So it's a, it's sort of an external, but that may not be completely external. That could just be like the next neural layer. Um, in theory, you could go a couple neural layers out. If, how many arcs if there's six or whatever, <laughs> seven. Uh, at some point, you know, there may be an external to the person and signal that would, that would just act as the supervisor. Um, that, that's very that's very helpful. I think that that explains one misconception. The other one is the connection between um, the word arousal as of like just a mismatch versus oh no signal, right? Or like pay attention signal. That's that's a little bit more broad, and that might happen when you think something is a category, you're working with it a category, and then you just realize that no, this is not the category. Uh oh. I better reorient, and that would be more the broader uh, arousal signal as opposed to like the really narrow arousal signal. Here, uh, using the kind of cortical heterarchy hierarchy and in the in in Helen's sense, it, it might be useful, right? Because limbic areas presumably are much fewer in number and size and all of that. They're not going to be that sophisticated in their representations, but they could be doing something art-like in the sense that they're categorizing the broad behavioral state that you're in. So it may not always be the same even neural structure so there could be some sort of local vigilance like thing that doesn't involve the uh, ach sources that's happening in v1 for instance which is that you think that the border is here but it's slightly off somewhere else or something like that and you can have you can embed them hierarchically so the limbic mismatches are probably the ones that really shake you to, to, to the point where I thought I was in a safe situation to eat, but as it turns out, the cat is back or something like that for the mouse, you know? So um, that would be the category, the whole situation, like all the situations you're in are the categories. Right, and then next. this situation I'm matching to safe is the category and situation is the, the um, all the little features are saying, is this part of safe? And then you would say, actually, it's not. It's not safe, and that would be the mismatch. So you could have like, like, and that's where you would want to place your, you know, the, the big ones, right? The 
the, 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 the primordial em- drives and emotions and things like that. And so, so on some level at, the, at that level, you have uh, pre-specified categories and maybe not a whole lot of new ones can come out at, at that sort of ancient level. Um, so there's ways of embedding it. And some of this is going to be already in the, this Steve's cog emo interaction stuff, which I haven't looked at carefully. So, uh, so yeah, I just thought it, that, that you, this, which I mentioned before, the Schmidt Hubel thing could relate. So it's like, depending on your vigilance, um, your notion of what's interesting may change. And I think here's something that, that is important in the social context of education, which is that curiosity, um, is related to how safe you feel. So creating a safe environment for children is really, 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 really important um, for them to be able to explore. And so you can think of that in terms of vigilance, which is that certain situations allow you to have high vigilance, and uh, but in a safe context. So you can be highly vigilant about safe things and then form very subtle, refined representations of things related to art and music and, and science and math. But if you are for, for some, and so, so that's why vigilance need not always relate to stress and anxiety in the direction that we think. So some kinds of stress and anxiety and whatever are going to pull vigilance in the other direction so that you're making very rough categorizations. And it's again, it's a sign flip compared to just the use of the word arousal, but we should, that's a red herring, you know, the, the word arousal, because we may need to rename it something else in certain situations where you're pulling the 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 scale of your categorization system down or oh, sorry the scale the scale goes up if your course graining the scale goes up so so you have to be like flexible about that um, uh, and so the link between these two is, it's a fun thing right the limbic system and the um, more refined systems are one is creating an environment for the other and we should like and I think that's something to like keep in mind and it's also a very positive message for people to, re- and Dan Bullock in on this paper that he also talks about, that creating safe environments is super important. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, you know, I, just to, just to, you know, riff, riff on that. I mean, look, you know, the, these, these limbic systems, and there are many people, including like Louise Pizzella, who thinks we should ban the term limbic system from the neuroscience literature, because it, it, it you know, it, is underspecified. Um, the, the anatomist will be the last holdouts. <laughs> and you know, Steve uses arousal in unfortunate. This is one of the big problems with translating Steve into the rest of neuroscience is that Steve uses these terms that other people use in a very, very specific fashion to Steve. And you just have to get around that if you're ever going to read Steve's papers. But, you know, look, I mean, when we're talking about, say, the serotonin system or the dopamine system, you know, th- these are modulatory systems on the rest of the brain. If your norepinephrine goes off, like you are in a different mental state. I mean, that is fight or flight. I mean, you are like, uh-oh, something's changed to the point that I have to decide what my existence, what, what the best thing for my existence is, not whether I see a flower or not, you know, and, and, you know, you know what that reminds me of this, this metaphor from like stress of the stressor bucket. And in, in fact, for the first time, I just remind it, I just thought the mat, the match mismatch mechanism is like the stressor bucket metaphor, where you can increase the size of your bucket. Uh, and then you are more able to deal with certain mismatches at, at that, at that, uh, I'm going to call it limbic for lack of a better term, but and in, at that emo, emo, emotion motivation level, that bucket can become smaller or larger. Uh, so, so again, like, it's like you were saying that where you place these terms, you have to kind of be a little bit flexible, uh, when you're re kind of re rescaling it for, for yeah. vaguer, um, well, I, so I don't know how much more in detail you're going to go into this. Did, uh, you can you can cut me off if you have slides about it. But I mean, so so Steve's Steve's idea, you know, of the idea of arousal being the co-symptom of autism and schizophrenia is that sch- schizophrenia um, has uh, under arousal during important uh, learning conditions and autism has over arousal. And what that gets you is that in autistic patients, they create way too many categories of things that should be generalized. And in schizophrenia patients, they get way too many bottom-up stimuli that are lumped together in the same thing. 
And that really, really hurts their ability to do, say, social cognition, which is how we diagnose these things. So I also think, um, obviously, I, I was <laughs> so what some of my work was about a while ago, but um, I, I think the ACH, the acetylcholine, makes a lot of sense. I mean, I think there are a bunch of neurotransmitters that are possible and it's a combination maybe, but um, I think the, the spatial specificity um, is important for like, you know, targeting specific perceptual areas. Um, but I also, but if you look at, um, you know, effects of drugs like scopolamine that block muscarinic receptors, I believe I have this all correct, but I haven't looked at that this in years. But yeah, that's um, the right action. It, 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 it does, um, it does seem to affect um, the, the size of categories that, that animals form in experiments. So um, there's pretty good behavioral evidence, um, I think. And um, um, you know, the, exact, the exact mechanisms on like what, what cells and layers and how they're affected is super complicated maybe, but I, I really think there's a lot of evidence that acetylcholine is a, is a pretty good candidate for, for playing this vigilance role. Martin Jesse, can Parker. you dig up that? Can you dig up that reference with the size of categories? That's super cool. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, there's they're not like amazing papers, but there's definitely some that you know seem to suggest that to me. Um, but yeah, I can I can pull it up. And Steve has um, a yeah, yeah, sure. review where he he cites some of this stuff too. Oh, that'd be perfect then. Yeah, yeah. If you could point so, me at that, that'd be awesome. There's a lot of like, like it's never the case that that it's pure a pure like uh, like Hail Mary of, of of modeling at this at this stage. Um, it's it's just that like if there are results that are like wildly out of line with what Steve's saying, he might he's probably not gonna cite it, you know. But um, but the, but it I feel as though you know based on what what we we know at the course level, the we have some story that we're telling about neuro, neuromodulators that isn't, isn't complete guesswork and it's not changing every two years, right? We're starting to accumulate reasonably solid ideas about these things. Uh, it's the detail, it's like, the, and this meso scale is not bad. It's the details that where the, the specific effects on you know, in individual dendrites and things, they could be um, sort of come, sort of they seem sometimes to be pulling in opposite directions. And, from a modeler's perspective, it's nice to know that you can have these contextual like uh, pulls in both directions. It gives you degrees of freedom uh, uh, for the learning, for instance, and for meta learning. And like, like maybe you could have on a single dendritic tree different learning rates, you know, as a result of things like this, you know, which would be really interesting for for complicated uh, patterns. Uh, like how where are you or how the how big your exponential you know fall off is even once you've gated. It's something that would be interesting to think about as a, an additional degree of freedom for um, for control. Yeah, I, I would I would honestly go even further and say it would be extremely surprising if natural selection hadn't taken advantage of the opportunities present, presented to itself with unique circuits in the brain that each have their own kind of computational benefits. Being able to turn up the volume or down the volume on them as you start to navigate your world seems like a really, really easy pl place to buy robust action um, that could give you benefit. So I, I would be extremely surprised if this is a single neurochemical at the end of the day, it's gonna be a complicated interaction between neurochemicals and kinds of in latent features of circuits that give rise to certain kinds of computational benefits and costs. And as you start to mess with those things, you can start to get benefits and you can, maybe there's some phenotypes where you start to leverage too much in one direction and that has some benefits. Like you can remember now a thousand digits of pi but you're also really, really crappy at handling it when somebody puts a tag on the inside of your shirt. And so there's, there's gonna be features that go with each other and, and other ones that are positive and negative depending on the context. But to me, if I don't think we should be looking for a single chemical there, right? We should be looking yeah, for systems that get changed together. Yeah, it's a matter of like the first term in the infinite series, which is why I think even though there's a lot in this type of modeling, I still think it's a rational reconstruction. It's, you, it's, yeah, like, it's something agree. that you see and you've like lopped off a lot of the edges that you don't quite like and, and, uh, and you've made something that, um, so, so there are these issues, right? But like, and just to, to reuse the same uh, vigilance metaphor, it's like, if you're really, really vigilant about what you expect from a neural model, then you get what Eric Schwartz used to call cargo cult neuroscience, where you're just reproduced 
a, a brain and you understand nothing because you don't have any principles. It's like that Norbert Wiener quote, right? The best model of a cat is another, or preferably the same cat. Uh, <laughs> so, so you, you have to dial this in, and, and depending on what you need to do, what you're, what you're, you'll be moving this dial around, you know? Um, there will be situations where the thing that you're describing, if then kind of structures will be the best way. Um, and otherwise, uh, something in the middle might be fine. And, and so it's like, as we move the dial up, we're going to be discovering all kinds of like new uh, things that, that we'll have to deal with. But we don't ne necessarily need to reset the, the pattern at the level at which it operates well. So here's where this idea of like the multi, so, and it's part, potentially a critique of art, which is that if I'm able to have both fine grained and coarse grained categories for the same topic, or whatever that topic is, how do I decide which one is the one that I need now? Because because if there are many hierarchies of categories, um, there could be situations where some meso scale uh, thing is what I need, and there could be other situations where the broad category is what I need. Clearly, we don't throw away the fact that a dog is a mammal um, when uh, we are talking about uh, specific breeds of dog or specific dogs. We kind of retain all of these. And so even in the space of categories, there seems to be flexibility of movement. Jesse, you wanted to say that? Oh, sorry. No, I'm listening. But yeah. I didn't want to say that. But yeah, I mean, that's just like, so coming back to, so I actually think that this rational reconstruction concept is super useful. And I'm going to actually talk about something that last time happened in the, in the after party, which is um, we talked about like, well, what are symbols? And, what's, uh, and can we use Grossbergian thinking to talk about Simple, like higher cognition. And initially I was like, I really don't know. But but there's this metaphor, sort of mixed metaphors that I like to use, which I don't know how to turn into anything resembling a model. But I, I think that when people talk about symbol manipulation, it's a surface level phenomenon. They're just talking about what are basically visible islands that are floating on top of like deep kind of structures, which are the grounding. And the ground, and that's a little bit like what Steve talks about that, you know, it's the, the F2 going back to F1 that is neglected. So when, so if you're studying, say, someone doing symbol manipulation, what you can see is like this sim apparently simple manipulation of symbols. Like the thing that he quotes about the symbol grounding problem by, by someone else, Steve Harnad, is very odd. So it's like, how can the meaning of the meaningless symbol tokens manipulated solely on the basis of their arbitrary shapes be grounded in anything but other meaningless symbols. Very odd framing. Like, why would anyone think that the basis of manipulation of symbols is their shape? Like, that's precisely the kind of superficial um, <coughs> approach to, to symbols that's a problem. Um, so the, the manipulation is all that other stuff. Like, so in fact, the way that I would put it is that this grounding is producing rule-like behavior, but it's only a rational reconstruction that turns that into rules. And this is a very effortful process, this last thing. So like, for instance, like some people say that the mind has to be symbols, right? And it's like, well, why are people so bad at algebra then? Majority of people struggle with algebra and like uh, fractions even. Um, and it takes a heck of a lot of effort and training, you know, in safe environments in order for people to learn these uh, more fancy uses of symbols. If symbols were like this default structure that existed in people's heads, why would that be the case? I think that it's that the creation of the kinds of invariances where you really shake something out of its context are rational reconstructions, where you reflect on these things which are only rule-like. Like, so the, the sub, the sub uh, underwater structures aren't really rules. They're more context dependent. Uh, and and they, they, are, they can keep track of exceptions in a somewhat ad hoc way. And then analyzing that surface phenomenon pr produces this new thing. So, um, so this. So, uh, so, are you saying that a symbol is like a category with more? Is it just that there's more extra um, rules that are are details about whether this is in the category or not? What? How does grounding add anything to make it a symbol as opposed to just a category? What I'm trying to say with these arrows at the bottom is that the thing that, that, that art, my art doesn't do is tell you how categories interact with each other in this compositional way. So uh, how do you get all these 
if thens and when this but not this then that and all of those you know highly sophisticated things right uh, Steve has some ideas about that it's not, it's not, but uh, so I'm this is not a critique of, of art or it's just that this topic of symbols is keeps coming up and so this is a way for me to try to say that symbol manipulation is an emergent phenomenon and so, and the way that we describe symbol manipulation including in things like Chomsky and linguistics and, and, and even when people describe how someone plays chess, right? You can construct something which could be accurate, actually, uh, and, and capture some version of an idealized chess player or language speaker, but not be how people actually use it. Uh, uh, do it in, uh, because it's more like this more complicated um, structure, which produces rules in an emergent way, but the rules aren't represented directly anywhere. Uh, until you do this subsequent step. So, uh, that's the idea. So, so you're no, saying a, a symbol is a category with action rules, essentially. The right? action rules aren't specified as we think when we do GoFi, which is explicit if then statements operating on them. So the it's like backwards, which is that the if then uh, rules, etc., come from um, processes that are a bit more like associative learning and hippocampal context dependent thing, things like that, which you may so you may not find anything isomorphic to the rules in any obvious sense until the person explicitly knows the rules so as long as we know that people when they introspect they don't have any rules in their head for that that accurately uh, align with what they're doing you can't be guaranteed that that what's uh, what's producing the symbol manipulation looks like the reconstruction so johan then why do you think that uh, that the basics of algebra were discovered uh, around 2000 years before the calculus that's a good question so uh, I, I think that 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 language is like the uh, kind of in, contains in it the capacity for algebra but but a lot of social kind of effort needs to be put um, put into allowing a subset of people to to create those invariances kind of like basically shake off a lot of the meaning of words in order to uh, in order to do like abstractions because if you look at like babylonian math uh, exercises right people used to think that maybe they were practical but if you actually look at the specific problem they were useless they were just trying to teach people how the how the operations work so even though they might not have had explicit like x stands for this or the, like place systems they were teaching them implicitly by giving you all these problems which had no connection to what a Babylonian tax collector needed to, to know. Same apparently was there in ancient Egypt. So, so there was a way of, of making use of, of the ability of people to, like in fact, uh, what was I saying? Was it last time? The, this idea that um, uh, uh, the best way to talk about certain kinds of analogies, maybe to use linguistic examples rather than um, um, area. What was the example? Something to do with math. I saw something on Twitter, but but uh, some people want like these highly visual math tutorials that have um, like uh, like distributivity. A times in brackets B plus C is equal to A B plus A C. And when I look at that kind of rule, I don't think about like areas. So they were like, you know, what if you have a square of this length and another square of that length, and then you justify it with a bunch of squares, right? But I was thinking, well. The, the distributivity that I'm familiar with is like, I'm going to the store and I'm going to buy apples, pears, and plums. So the buy part has been factored out. So I could have said buy apples, buy pears, and buy whatever. So already in language, in the way that grouping happens, you're seeing algebra-like structure. Um, so, but I think that the more abstract they are, the more you can need to effortfully create invariances that aren't there for most people. And, and, you know, that's the, the struggle is to, so because like people find it hard to break the connotation of something like, and say, and because people will often ask, what does it mean? But in, in school, it's, it's often hard to learn certain kinds of math topics because the teacher might not even know what it means in the long run. They're just like, here, learn a bunch of abstract rules. And some kids are just fine with that. Uh, and other, others need grounded, um, they need to know why. So, and that's clue, right? <laughs> that, that the context, plugging into the limbic system, all that is 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 needed. And not that they can't do sophisticated rule-based uh, activities, but they're always context grounded. So it's like in the population, there's like some sort of almost like a vigilance parameter, right? Of how much can you break out uh, of context and suppress context? 
You know, I just had an idea with that vigilance and in this figure that you have on here, that really shouldn't say symbols at the top, that should say categories. Symbols are at the bottom because they have the rules. And the water level that you have is the vigilance. If you lower the water level, that's making bigger categories. And if you raise the water level, you're making smaller, more precise categories, just like the, the vigilance level in, in art, right? Right, this is the danger with mixed metaphors, right? Because I was thinking that the water level is not about something happening in any one person's brain, but instead is our social ability to understand what's going on in people. So well, then you're going to have reinforcement. So uh, that's... Uh, but because because like it's like this, right? Because you can observe and make actually true statements about emerging phenomena. Like for instance, some of the most accurate phenomena that you can get are like, you know, think of the law of large numbers, right? It's something that forms when you have done something like an averaging, right? Or gas laws, right? So it could be that when you study language uh, at some kind of sufficiently coarse grain, you get sharp rules, but then the expectation that those sharp rules must be in every individual person, maybe like one of those, what's it called? A representative heuristic fallacy or something like that, which is like, you take something that's a product of an average of a population and assume that in individuals have to conform to the template. <laughs> so we are getting a mismatch there. Um, so, so yeah, uh, I'm just saying that the rules may be nowhere look, they may not look like rules that we uh, use to implement Conway's game of life, for instance. But yet you could get behavior that looks like that is what I'm trying to say. So, so we, we, we may be uh, underestimating the redundancy of description, that two different things where, which physically have quite different uh, natural descriptions for lack of a better term, uh, might produce on the surface level quite similar behavior, uh, especially when you're averaging to produce that surface level phenomenon. Like look how Chomsky rejects all kinds of linguistic exceptions. And it's like, well, they just made a mistake. <laughs> that's, that's the type of averaging that he's doing, right? Uh, so, uh, so when you factor out all of that, you get something. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm sort of feeling like our current discussion is more post. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll stop the share. Yeah.